Thank you, Senator. Privilege to follow the supervisor and the senator. Now we'll get to the, to the H team in the House. I also want to um, thank our sponsors. Um, this is a 20-year tradition. I didn't know that until our moderator said that. Um, but I, I do very much appreciate our, our chamber and the businesses that sponsored this, although today I couldn't get to the donuts. So usually I get back. It's, um, uh, it's important to have an excellent crowd and an excellent exchange. I'm, I'm glad to be a part of the, the panel to be hearing, and this isn't uh, the beginning or the end of, of, uh, of that. Um, our, our moderator, our MC, called himself part-time. He's, uh, he's a full-time volunteer, but I, I think the, uh, the sponsors are going to get more than their money's worth out of you today. I heard, I heard you do it for free. And um, so may, may you get your money's worth out of, out of all of us. And we will be listening. I want to start with um, education just a little bit, uh, the touch beyond what's already come up. The number of people, particularly elected officials on our school board and uh, school officials that work here that, that complemented the deappropriation leaving out local schools um, is significant. Almost every one of them I've heard from on that part. So where the senator spoke to cutting well over a hundred million dollars out of the current budget that's a significant thing I served as a school administrator in this town I was on the superintendent's cabinet at the time of the 10 percent across the board <coughs> budget cut we had to take four million dollars out of Ankeny school spending during the year it was already in the middle of the second quarter when we found out about it it was a very painful thing for schools and later for property taxpayers to make that work. I'm also glad that in the DIA Pro, that local government was left out. That means our counties or the supervisor wouldn't have said nice things today, you've been mad at us, kidding. And likewise our cities. The, um, there was a lot of talk about not doing the property tax backfill. Back on education. With Representative Landon, uh, we co-sponsored a bill that deals with on-time funding. For those of you that know what that is, um, you know, that, that explains it by itself, but our district is one of the few that grows every year and doesn't get paid for those kids on time. We wait a year for over 400 new kids to be paid for in terms of the state reimbursement that provides the teacher in the classroom and the brick and mortar that provides the place. It's, a, it's an awkward thing to have that year after year after year. We are working on that issue. One of many flexible areas. I'll talk about four more. I'll be brief on these. The penny sales tax we all pay is folded into a state program now. I have a bill that is um, individually spawned. No, no, wait a minute. Representative Landon is a part of this also, where we extend the penny 20 years. It doesn't have any of the biases of um, both parties regarding what ought to be left out of that brick and mortar infrastructure funding. Um, I have a bias, a strong one, that, um, and I know there are people from Johnston that are, that are here with Johnston schools, but where Johnston and West Des Moines Valley are building athletic stadiums out of that penny, I know there are a number of taxpayers sincerely offended by the notion that we don't do full focus on academics. But in respect for local control, and I'm not one that promises every vote I ever take is going to just embellish local control and not look at a state perspective on it, but I'm pretty strong-minded about local control, and, and the record proves it, so I have a couple more bills I'll speak to. But on this issue, we have a clean bill that I hope goes to education so that the education lobby can be strong in expressing what needs to be part of extending that penny. We need it. We need it so that there is not more of the property tax or other focus going on how schools expand space. This is a district. We could use a little more in this room today, I think. But the, uh, the district has that squeeze quite frequently. We need that penny. Categorical funding. Senator did a nice job of talking about you know, school buses with that thing. Um, I killed a grassy bill this week um, on a, that's not the senator that everybody knows, it's a guy named Pat that's chair of appropriations in, in the house. He had a school bill that dealt with professional development. And as I listened, uh, in fact, Brad Hudson's in the room today. Uh, his input and others regarding um, the impact of the bill, it has, it's important to have some flexibility, but there were some issues with it. 
Um, I want to demonstrate in that some bipartisan listening and work on how we increase this flexibility. I also have a bill just filed that deals with looking at all those categoricals. That one, like the bus example, had a silo within the silo. Professional development core is allowable in the general part of professional development categorical funding, but it also has a separate one called core. And there's there's political reasons why there's a silo and a silo, but it's one of a dozen. We don't we don't need this thing being that complicated. So a bill that's in where we will be amending it, but it deals with taking all of those categorical funding areas for schools, puts them in one pot, maintains all the requirements of what districts are providing service from each of those various areas, pays respect to where there's federal money, and allows local control on the use of those funds. I believe the one area that will have the most political conversation about that in House and Senate will be um, protection for talented and gifted. If that is not protected in the bill from what we start with. It's a totally flexible bill. Preschoolers. I'm strong-minded, having served on early childhood for several years in a fashion of, a, of this district, that uh, of the of state focus, I don't mean this district, I mean um, Council for Education for uh, Council for Early Access. <sighs> Looking at um, preschool, particularly the four-year-old universal program, there is a, um, a failure in performance to put focus on kids in poverty. It's just, it's not easy to do because it takes more money to find a way that those kids can be delivered to the preschool program or the wraparound services can be part of the package. And there's not flexibility in the funding to do that and we've got a good bipartisan bill going, had one very uh, extensive uh, subcommittee on that so far, and we're going to uh, work very hard to adjust that and increase flexibility in that. Last, there'll be what the education chair, Walt Rogers out of Waterloo, wants to call a uh, sort of an omnibus or melting pot bill on flexibility that will take a lot of issues um, into one bill for a broad discussion about other aspects of increasing flexibility for schools and funding. The uh, labor conversation, uh, there'll be, a, uh, of course, a very important public hearing, Monday night, 6 to 8, Supreme Court room. There was a very important one this last week on SSA in the same room, also on Monday of, of this, this week, just passed. The, on the labor bill, I want to just reinforce, of course, one, two, three, on um, my take on what the senator has already rather well articulated. I have a thousand email in my in-basket that clearly state, they don't say bozo or moron, but they say, you are taking away our health insurance. As the senator already, I think, made clear, that is not true. I want, I want our public to know that the bill does not take away health insurance. In fact, the impacts of the bill, here's my one, two, three. The bill provides that the public sector must provide health insurance. Jack said that just a slightly different way. The bill provides that management and employees meet and confer on health insurance and on any, every other benefit. People don't. We'll, we'll take your questions later. As it's my turn, here's my point. The bill does not prohibit that you meet and confer, it prohibits that we go to impasse over that issue. What the bill provides for an impasse and arbitration is that that matter is dealt with in wages. And so, as there are members of the public here that, that are, of course, very passionate, I've had um, many tearful conversations and heard of many others regarding how devastating this bill is. That's an area, I'm going to tell you the truth, as I know it, and I'm going to work on this issue, and that is the meet and confer concept of what continues in the discussions between management and union are important. The areas in where we can go to arbitration and have impasse are limited to the bucks. They're limited to the wages. But the benefits will be part of the discussion, and health insurance will be provided. There are many, many other issues in that bill, but I wanted for folks that that see here and get source information that contradicts what I said, um, if I'm wrong, we'll fix it um, to the best of my ability. I'm going to move on to, uh, what? I've got the bill. 
moving on to um, human, human resources. Um, I'm passionate about a number of things that are going to go on that committee, on, and, and, and so much so I, I made significant change in where I serve, asking the speaker to let me get back on HR. And one of the primary reasons is, is what our supervisor brought up earlier about mental health. Don't need to say a lot about, about um, services beyond what what our supervisor already shared, other than highlighting, as he said, there's a six million dollar gap in the capacity of the current system to provide revenue to the mental health region that we live in compared to what the needs are, and that six million dollar gap that he spoke to <coughs> means 1,000 persons currently served not being served through mental health in the future. I think that's got our attention, um, and yet the fix is not simple. There are a number of people in the room that are from Amos. Um, I want to thank you for having the best attended forum of the five I was a part of in the period you might call the campaign on the way to this, to this path. And you spoke wisely, articulately around your priorities. Your number one priority was to deal with local control on the issue of property tax or other funding to solve this problem. I serve as one of four co-chairs. There's two two uh, senators, two reps, two Democrats, two Republicans, a bipartisan effort that's looking hard on this issue, not just from the standpoint of what bills are we gonna put in, what the people really need to understand about what is wrong in our funding of the mental health structure. And let me capture just a couple other quick pieces. I agree with what the supervisor said, although I'm gonna raise the number on. I'm convinced that the demographics on increase in Polk County population since the dollar cap. Usually when we talk about property tax, we're talking about rates, not per capita. That's not the way the law is structured. But the, the reality is we've grown by 132,000 plus people in that period of time when we still we have the same amount of money available for it. That's an issue that needs attention because in, in this county and in this region, that creates a huge gap in the capacity to provide the service. And many of us in the room would be able to accept this statement. It doesn't look like a year where the state is going to pump new money into a system. Since that reality is agreed upon by many, I appreciate Farm Bureau and others that typically just flat out hate any notion where a clown like me is going to say, we're going to raise property taxes. Uh, that does not go down well, and yet we're going to be looking at it. Otherwise, Four of the 13 regions that serve, we've restructured mental health into a reform in recent years, has 13 regions across the state. Four of them are on, on the path to crash in less than three years if something isn't done to balance the funding source. And the only source right now is property tax, and the lid on it that's 21 years old, uh, in a county that grew by 132,000 people, that might just create a problem, and it does. And it's really a problem if you're in a region with 22 counties, or even five, and the reality is one county has all the population, and it's growing, and they have a dollar cap preventing them from paying their fair share. Doesn't work. That means smaller counties are funding urban centers, and they probably don't like it. And so they'll crash as a region if we don't do something to address it. We're, we're working on that issue, and it, it does involve uh, a property tax increase, but I have it on good authority, including our supervisor at the table, that if that feature is fixed so that it's legally possible to put more property tax into that issue, the game plan in our county is not to raise taxes. You lower something else and you make this work, but at least you have the capacity to spend on that. We need it. And so I, I really believe locally and statewide that's a, that's a huge issue without a lot of it. Um, current attention, and I appreciate the supervisor inviting me to mouth off on that one a little bit. Um, it's probably uh, time for me to uh, uh, find out a little more about the budget from Representative Landon, but I want to close with this. The, the concept of um, the in-basket, there, there are two people that I reached um, this morning in this room who had left a phone message that um, I haven't been able to return yet. There have been days when the in-basket reaches 3,000. It's not possible to reach um, an answer each one of those in a day's time. 
Um, yesterday I got almost no email out and it wasn't a day we're in session and I spent the day at the Capitol on, on working on a couple of these bills that are filed and other things that have to be done for next week. So I'm not asking for sympathy about the pace. I just want to apologize to those of you where I haven't responded to your uh, voicemail that's on a computer in, in my, uh, or you didn't get an email response yet. We'll be working on it. We'll get caught up doing the best we can on that moving forward with the, with the pace of work. Didn't, didn't, didn't articulate, I didn't understand that exactly, but we'll look forward to the question. We'll hold you to it. Very good. And so with that, why don't I sit down and shut up and let's hear from Representative John Landon.